Hello, everybody. I am too loud. So um, I don't know how you follow that level of enthusiasm, especially when you're going to give a presentation on intellectual property law, but I'm going to try. So it's 4 o'clock in the morning, my time. I've been drinking coffee all morning, so I think I'm ready to rip. So a little bit about myself. Jason Kasky. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Everyone here says, where's Omaha, Nebraska? And everyone from the United States who's from California or New York says, it's somewhere in the middle and I've flown over it. Um, uh, I actually moved back. I had the opportunity to go to college at Santa Clara University, which is in Silicon Valley. And I worked in Silicon Valley for about three or four years working with technology companies. I had the good fortune of working during the internet boom in the late 90s, and I helped Palm go public as a public relations uh, executive and marketer. I asked too many questions, ended up at law school, and everyone's been paying the price ever since. So what I'm going to do here is talk a little about intellectual property and what it's going to mean for you and your business. The last introductory thing I need to say is every single one of those startups that got up here and spoke for three minutes about their lifeblood and what they've been dedicating themselves to is ridiculously, ridiculously difficult. And I think we should all give a hand to every single person who got up here and made a pitch. So first thing that comes up is what's intellectual property? I just program. I'm just sitting here trying to get customers. I'm trying to help solve people's things. And then you said that you're going to be talking about pirates, trolls, and spiders. Why do they want my IP? Well, here's the first thing. I'm going to do some very, very introductory things. There's three types of property. There's real property. You're sit standing and sitting on it. There's personal property. You're holding it. Then there's intellectual property, which um, under the statutes in Lithuania, it's called industrial property. Intellectual property. Technically, it's defined as the fruits or products of human creativity. That, that's kind of poetic. That's, that, what does that mean? It's stuff you make up. So it's what comes from your head. It's not tangible. It is what you guys focus on and what you do every day. 75% of the assets of publicly traded companies is made up of their intellectual property. When people are buying and selling stocks and starting IPO, uh, doing the, performing their IPO and doing all this, the vast majority of what people are buying is the intellectual property of these companies. For you and what you're doing, the vast majority, almost 100% of your assets, except for the small amount of computers and other sorts of things that you have, is made up of your intellectual property. That's what your investors are interested in. Very, very short history lesson because I wasn't very good at history. Intellectual property um, and, and the, the protection of it, this is not a new concept. Paris Convention, 1883, uh, Paris Convention for the Protection of in, in, Industrial Property, this is what was the basis for this, the protection of patents. Um, some of your software will be patentable. S a lot of it will, will have processes that don't necessarily meet those requirements that we'll talk about in a second. But this is not a new concept, and it's not a concept that came from the States or anything. This came from this part of the world. In 1886, there was a Berne Convention for the protection of literary and artistic works, novels, songs, operas, musicals, a whole bunch of stuff. This also includes software. We're going to skip a lot of history because I don't like history. Both of these are now governed by the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO. Lithuania joined in 1994, and the US actually joined only a few years before that in 1989. US also has constitutional protections. Um, this is mostly in here for my friend who is a constitutional law snob. It was in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 as follows, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by a whole bunch of things that are, uh, sound very high-minded. Types of intellectual property. We've got patents, we have copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. I thought that was a nifty diagram of the patent for a bicycle seat. It reminded me of the Brooks seat that I'm coveting. So what exactly is a patent? And why do we have it? It protects other people from selling your inventions. There are three types of patents. We have utility, utility patents, design patents, and plant pass uh, patents. This is for the genetic modification and the hybrid plants that uh, go mostly in agriculture. 
The requirements to, to have something that's patentable, it has to be useful, it has to be novel, and it has to be non-obvious. And so um, mostly what this means is if you have this idea and a design, uh, go talk to a patent attorney because they know a lot more than I do about this, and they're going to be able to help assess what sort of protections you need to do for the things that you are inventing and coming up with. Now, US patent number six million is somewhat dear to my heart. Um, we're up in past the eight millions in the United States, uh, and that's only been in the last uh, probably 10 years. We've had another two million patents pat, uh, that have been granted. US patent number six million, I actually helped do the public relations on it. It was for the mobile sync technology between the handheld computer and your desktop computer that made Palm a lot of money in the late 90s. And the US Patent and Trademark Organization was really, really excited about it. We're hitting six million. Silicon Valley's awesome. We've got tech companies. We are going to make a great big deal about this. I'm gonna let you know something else. The numbers, it isn't necessarily um, ascribed specifically on when you uh, uh, submitted it. They did a little picking and choosing. They went for somebody who had a lot of stuff going on in the press. They're like, we're gonna make a great, great press release and, and make a big deal in production about this. Palm was in the middle of its IPO, which for all of you who don't know, companies go into what's called a quiet period. And the whole reason that they have a quiet period is so that there is no um, undo outside factors that affect the stock value. And so the United States Patent and Trademark Organization wanted to make a big deal about it, and the only thing Palm would say is, yes, we've been granted patent number six million and we're very happy about it. And so not everything works out the way that they want it to be. The practical, practical aspects of what your startup needs to think about with patents is that your customers and your clients are gonna to wanna to make sure that you aren't violating anyone else's patents. They're gonna ask what's called indemnity of you so that they're gonna ask for a guarantee that you are not infringing anyone else's patents and then they're gonna ask you to step up to the plate and be responsible in case they get sued by third parties based on the intellectual property that you're giving them access to through your applications and services. Generally, should not be an issue. You guys have made this up. You have, you've done this, this is the fruit of your conjecture. And so you're like, we didn't copy anyone, what's the problem? The issue are the trolls. And what a troll is, is, is basically a derogatory term towards organizations that don't necessarily pat, uh, practice the technology that they're, they're um, suing on. They may just own it. And there was a whole swath of really, really broad patents that were granted in the technology space that had been accumulated but what in, the, um, uh, in this sphere called non-practicing entities. And they go out and they identify targets that may or may not be utilizing technology in a manner that infringes on their patent. And you get a letter. And that letter says, hey, you're infringing our patent. Pay us money. That's a problem, especially when you take in consideration where you guys are, uh, a lot of your, your companies are right now. You don't have a lot of money. You're looking for money. You're looking for customers. And so these things can be very, very damaging. And so there are a few things that you need to do. You need to make sure that if you're using any other intellectual property in, as the basis of what you're doing, that you have the rights to do it. A lot of you are probably relying on open source components. That's great, open source is awesome. It allows you to get where you need to be quickly. I can say I have clients that are from the startup phase to Fortune 1 companies. And I can tell you the Fortune 1 companies are gonna have a large, uh, either a large issue or put you under a lot of scrutiny to use your technology if you're using a lot of open source because they're worried about the, the modifications that you're doing for them that they expect to own being subject to the, to the terms of the open source and that what they expect to own won't be theirs. We're gonna skip past patents here. To copyright, for those of you that are doing software, this is probably what matters most to you. Copyright protection 
protects original works of authorship, including literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, and certain other works, including software. It has to be original. Short phrases don't count. So if you come up with something that's, that's not a novel or a, you know, even your marketing materials, you can get trademark protection. Uh, list of ingredients don't count. So what you put in there doesn't matter. Coca-Cola, that's what you use trade secrets protection for. Your expression of your ideas um, does count. And so the way that you put everything together is what matters for copyright, and that's where your software protection comes in. So um, the, there's some in, interesting uh, uh, things that I have, I have helped my customer, my clients, protect and, and deal with. Um, one of the clients that I have that's a little bit more interesting than others is I, I represent a rock band. And so this rock band is, you know, better capitalized than most rock bands. And so they're going out and they're able to produce professional videos all the time. They do their own songs. It's wonderful. Their videos look great. Um, I liked them on Facebook. And the, uh, uh, their, their latest video came up and it was, hey, check out our new cover of, Rihanna so of this Rihanna song. I looked at it. This video looks awesome. Their rendition of the, of the Rihanna song is great. However, the way that it works in the United States, anyone can do a cover song. That's why you can hear cover songs all the time. It's, there's called what is a, a, a mandatory license um, so that you cannot prevent somebody from covering your song. For every time they sell it, there is a statutory royalty that they get. It's 9.8 cents per minute. I mean, not per minute, per song. So every download, the songwriter gets 9.8 cents. The thing is, with that license does not include certain components of the song or rights to use with the song. One of them is the, called a sync license. And the sync license is what allows you to have moving video or film with the, uh, with the song. It seems kind of silly because if you're um, you know, recording a live concert, that should be somewhat put together, but it's not necessarily there on a cover. And so, I sent these guys a, a little note, and they're notorious. They're rock stars. They don't answer my emails. They're like, oh, yeah, it's the lawyer. He's doing unfun things and making us not be rock stars. But when I said, hey, did you guys get the sync license? I got an email response within five minutes. And the next morning, I had a bunch of guys who'd been on a, at a plane at a show until about 3 o'clock in the morning on the phone talking to them about this. So this stuff matters. Practical aspects of it. So... With your software, as all of these folks were, here, were up here, the vast majority of the questions that people were asking is, how are you making money on this? What, where, how are you going to increase value for your shareholders? And how are you going to get this in the hands of your clients? And so what happens with copyright, there are a whole bunch of different things that you can do with it. And you just keep slicing the bundle of sticks, is what we, we call it as lawyers, and, and parsing it and then selling how in, in these different bundles. So with respect to the software licenses, you do it by, based on number of users, number of devices it's going to be loaded on. How is it going to be done on a server basis? Is it going to be co-located for backup purposes and disaster recovery on multiple, in multiple data centers? Um, and are you going to sell it in the U.S.? Are you going to sell it in Lithuania? Are you going to give a broad license to, to, for use in the EU and then charge more money for use stateside? Those are the sort of things that when you are looking at the solution and how, are you, how you can make more money for the owners and the shareholders of the company, but also add value to your clients, those are the sort of things that you should be thinking about. And if you go talk to not just lawyers, I mean, I talk to too many lawyers and it, it gets old, but talk to the, the people that you're networking with. How are they bun bundling their solutions and making money on it? Um, and I think I covered all of those. The next thing is trademarks. So I'm actually going to have uh, seek out a few of the folks with respect to the marks that were coming up here because what you call yourself matters. You guys know that. You guys spend time thinking about what you're going to call yourselves. 
you need to spend probably more time thinking about it because the last thing that you want to do is spend a lot of effort and a lot of money on a name that you can't end up using. So, the more arbitrary and original the name is, the better. You look at the Exxons and the Chevrons, Google, Google was a, a, a modified use of the, the Googleplex uh, numerical term, and then Apple for computers. That's great. It's completely arbitrary. Computers aren't made of apples. However, what was another organization that was well known that used Apple in its name? Apple Records, Beatles label. That's great. Late 70s, early 80s, Apple's doing computers. Apple Records says we don't like it, but that's no big deal. You can continue to use it as long as you never get into the music industry. Well, as you guys know, Apple got into the music industry in a big way. And there was a reason why the Beatles were not in the iTunes catalog until not pretty recently. And there was a significant amount of money that was paid to Apple in order to make that dispute go away. Now, from a practical perspective, large companies check everything. Um, I don't know if the Lithuanian newspapers and, and print, you get circulars for advertising purposes. We get them on Wednesdays and Sundays in the newspapers in the United States. My large uh, retail client had my firm checking every single use of every term in the, in the circular. So if it said, this toy is awesome for kids, they would check that. They may not do a full extensive search, but they want to make sure that anything that they are printing and sending out isn't going to infringe anyone's mark. Um, the, you have to choose your, your battle strategically. I'm going to modify the name that I'm going to talk about a little bit, but I had a startup company a friend of mine started, and he has a really nifty mobile app that's tied to a service. It's going to be competitive, and it's intelligent, and they're going to call it, let's say, IntelliRumble. Sounds fine. It's kind of nifty. It, you know, duking it out, it, 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 it invokes something. We did a search on it. First thing it did, we went and looked on Google. Fine. Nobody's really using the mark. Not a big deal. We go and do um, a, a, an extensive search. The search itself costs about $600, and this company goes and uses an algorithm probably designed by somebody not quite as smart as everyone who's in this table, in, in this room and um, searches everything. And you get a big fat book about this thick with every use that they can find in print media, online media, everything. All the websites, tons of stuff, and you, we flip through it. And there was an interesting thing about that mark. And those of you with computers in front of you may be able to figure out because what the problem was, and it wasn't the battle part. It seemed that Intel, was somewhat, in a schizophrenic manner, going and just haphazardly going after any mark that had Intella in it. But we found lots of other marks that simply didn't. So from a legal perspective, we told our client, you know, we don't think they have a claim. But the fact of the matter is, Intel has a whole lot more money to fight irrespective of what their legal position, their actual legal standing and whether they would win or not. And so, as a startup, you need to be very, very cognizant of how you're spending your money. And I can tell you that waging an in, a, a trademark battle with Intel is probably not the most fun or, or effective use of your funds. So those are the sort of things you need to do. You can fight it. If it's something you actually, I mean, you love and it has to be that, you can do what, you, what needs to be done. But do your searches do them regionally, do them throughout the EU, and then if you have um, uh, the, the desire to, to move more broadly and go into the US and other markets, you need to do your, che your checks there. Trade secrets, these are fun. They're secrets. Don't tell anyone. These are the sort of things where your main protection is going to be a non-disclosure agreement. The things that you're protecting are anything that can be a value of a competitor. Essentially, that's what a trade secret is. For Coca-Cola, it's the recipe. For KFC, it's the Colonel's secret recipe of herbs and spices. But for you guys, for the folks who are planning on monetizing their, their application by 
com compilations of data, your data that you're compiling, it's, it's, not a, it's not patentable. You could probably get copyright protection, but possibly not. But it most definitely is a ta trade secret. It's, it's valuable intellectual property. And so you just need to be very aware and not distribute that information in a manner that causes doubt on the protections that you're affording it. Um, now, here's the last item, customers. We all love customers. They're the ones that pay us. Well, I can tell you the more sophisticated your customers get, they want a lot for what they're paying you. The base forms of agreements that I use for large organizations say that if you're doing any customization work whatsoever, they own it. And it makes sense, they're paying you money to do some stuff, but at the same time, you may just be tweaking a few things in order them for, for, to allow them to use your intellectual property. And so what you need to do is you need to be able to effectively communicate what is yours, what they're expecting to get, and just making sure that you aren't signing up for something that ultimately gives you the crown jewels of your company to your customer. Because, let's face it, large organizations are very, very used to getting their way, and they're very, very um, adamant about it. I have found in my dealings with um, European Union companies that the standards for the EU are actually even a little bit more uh, favoring the large organizations. I, I was rep representing some very large companies that complete loggerheads, they could not agree with respect to the intellectual property um, as to who was going to own what. And the, the large telecommunication companies and, and other sort of folks that you may want to partner with may be pretty inflexible with respect to the, what's called the work product and, and uh, ownership sections of your agreements. The thing is, you may just have to endure some crummy agreements. You may have to uh, sign up for some deals that aren't ideal in order to get the sort of momentum that you want and that you need, and then deal with the aftermath later. Now, I know I spoke a lot and pretty quickly, um, but I want, I want to actually be of value to, to you folks. If anyone has any questions, I'd love to hear them. You don't have to be polite. I'm an American. And if not, we can do one-on-one -on -one afterwards, right? Yeah, absolutely. Come up and find me. Sure. How much does it cost? Well, it's going to depend on what you want. Um, I cost less because I'm in the Midwest than folks that are on the, uh, on the coasts. Um, I'll be upfront. My hourly rate's around 200 bucks an hour to start with. And on the coast, for what I do, you're probably going to be paying $600 an hour for it in the United States. Well, it depends on what's going on. One of the things that, because this is the practice that I do, we've got form agreements. So if somebody comes up and goes like, oh, I'm going to have to draft every single provision, that's bunk. They've got the stuff to start with. So, you know, for most agreements, I don't know, five to 10 hours to get exactly what you want with respect to what you're doing. Um, but what I, that actually brings up a very good question though. It is far less expensive to pay a lawyer up front to give you advice than it is to come to a lawyer with a problem. Because when you have a problem, you don't have control. There's just something that has to be taken care of. You've got a cease and desist letter. You've got a, uh, a lawsuit on your hands where somebody's um, suing you for intellectual property infringement. As an example, and the reason why I brought up the infringement, especially before I was working at my firm, I was in-house counsel for uh, a company that provides te um, services to telecommunications companies. And they did not have, with one of their large customers, an indemnity clause that had the right exceptions in it. And so generally you say, sure, I'll take care of anything with respect to infringement, except to the extent of a lot of things, such as you're bolting it on to something that I don't have any control over. It cost them $6 million in litigation fees to finally convince the court that they shouldn't even be part of the lawsuit. We're talking about real monies, and when you're 
dealing with the patent trolls, those companies are funded basically by investors that have made um, conscious decisions that the cost of bitter litigation is outweighed by the royalty and um, license fees that they're going to get based on, on, their, uh, on their efforts. And so that's what you're up against. You know, the larger you get, the more successful you are, the bigger target that you become. Do we have any other questions? Thank All you very much for your time. All right, thank you.